Hello there. Welcome to my uh, profile series where we look at e-ink note-taking companies and kind of do a quick overview and review of who they are and what their market niche is. In this particular episode, the focus is on Remarkable, the probably the biggest brand name uh, with the exception of Amazon in the e-ink note-taking space. Um, so a pretty large company and we're gonna take a quick review of who they are, what they're good for, and maybe look into our crystal ball into the future. So we'll start with who they are. This is a company that's headquartered in Oslo, Norway, which is unusual. A lot of the other note-taking companies are in China. Um, not all, of course, um, but uh, this is one of the few exceptions that is headquartered in Europe. Um, in terms of their market segment, uh, I place them in what I call the writing first, reading second marketplace. And again, this isn't that you can't read on the Remarkable, I'm not saying that at all, but clearly the device is geared in particular toward note-taking. That's the emphasis and the focus. Um, of course, you can write on PDFs and what have you, but uh, clearly the way they advertise their device and the way they structure their UI, very focused on the writing experience. Um, another major player in the space would be Supernote um, as well. The very first Remarkable came out in 2017, just simply called the Remarkable, or we sometimes refer to it as the Remarkable 1. Then the Remarkable 2 came out in 2020, so it's been on the market for four years, which is partly the reason why there's so much buzz about the potential of a Remarkable 3, but we'll get to that in a bit. If we look at their current product line, it is just the Remarkable 2, uh, the 10-inch device. They have nothing else, no other sizes. You can't even buy the Remarkable 1 anymore. So they are a single device. They, of course, sell other peripherals like a keyboard cover, um, and they sell you know, styluses and what have you. Um, but their primary note-taking device, they just have one product. They don't even have variations of it. They all come with the same amount of uh, you know, storage capacity, same internals and all that good stuff. They have one product. So the Remarkable experience really is centered around um, their note-taking app, as we noted before. Um, it's pretty thoughtful in terms of how that's designed. Um, it has a simple UI. Uh, some people would look at that as, as a negative, but I think actually it works in the marketplace as a significant strength for Remarkable. Um, they're not uh, as known for having the, the range of features as a Supernote or as a books device, um, but that plays into how they're approaching the market. Um, and ultimately, while some look at that as a weakness, I actually think it's a strength, and I'll delve a little bit further into that later in the video. Um, no front lighting um, on the device, that's, that's one uh, negative if you need front lighting. Um, in addition to that, there is a subscription service, um, and that's to use you know, some of the features like their cloud-based services um, requires a subscription, and it runs about $3 a month, or I think you can just do a, a whole year at $30. Um, and some people are put off by that. Uh, no other device manufacturer in this note-taking space has a subscription. It's just remarkable. And they certainly took a lot of flack when they introduced that a few years ago at a higher price point. Um, the main use cases, you know, it's it's for note-taking. Um, and I say creative note-taking. Um, it, it's, it's, they really do focus on being a replacement for a pad of paper. Um, and they don't have the range, uh, as I noted, of, of features that maybe other devices have, but they're not a simple note-taking app either. You know, if I think of the offerings from Amazon and Kobo and BigMe, you know, Remarkable uh, offers more than what those companies offer and their note-taking app. Um, so they're kind of in the middle, I suppose, um, if you look at the marketplace overall. Um, so that's kind of where they, they function and uh, they have nice pen designs that lend itself well uh, to sketching. You can certainly sketch on other devices as well, but Remarkable I think is kind of known for um, having that functionality. So what are some alternate options if you're looking at the Remarkable 2 and you're not sure and you know, what else what might you look at? And I'll, I'll point to a couple items. I'll start with the Supernote A5X. Um, Supernote is also in kind of this writing first, reading second, where the note taking is clearly the focus of the device uh, in terms of UI and design. 
And uh, this is also a 10 inch device without front lighting, so kind of similar in that respect. Uh, so if you're looking at a, a note taking device first and foremost, and maybe you want something a little more sophisticated than the Remarkable, the Super Note would definitely be something you'd want to consider. And I'll throw in the, the Amazon Scribe as well. I guess the connection here is that um, you know, the Scribe provides a, a pretty solid hardware, uh, much like the Remarkable. Uh, Markle has excellent hardware, albeit older, uh, but it still holds up, I think, design-wise, as does the Scribe. Uh, the Scribe's note-taking app is not as sophisticated as Remarkable's, but it, you also have major brand recognition, um, and that's kind of why I, I thought of the Scribe as I thought about Remarkable. So those are two devices that someone might consider um, if, if they were looking at an alternate to the Remarkable 2. So as I kind of alluded to, it's been a while since the last Remarkable was released, and it's pretty clear that at this point, um, the, the internals of the device have been... Um, basically been outclassed by some of the competition. Perhaps most notably, Books released the Go 10.3 and on paper, um, you know, beats the Remarkable 2 in, in every single way. Um, and again, I'm focusing specifically here on the hardware aspect of it. It's even lighter, uh, or thinner, I should say, uh, than the Remarkable 2, which which is something that Remarkable advertises heavily um, if, if you're uh, going to buy that device. So from a hardware perspective, the Remarkable 2 is looking awfully stale. Um, even though, again, as I noted earlier, the design I think really still holds up. They really did build a classic design um, that's kind of unique in the note-taking space. Um, and I don't think that's aged, but certainly uh, competitors have been putting in the marketplace more powerful devices um, you know, in the four years since the original Remarkable 2 was released. So are we seeing a Remarkable 3 around the corner then? Well, that's not clear, and I'm actually going to kind of make the case why maybe not anytime soon. But there is kind of a looming deadline uh, approaching, which is in 2027, and that's when the European market um, is going to require all devices like the Remarkable 2 to have uh, user-replaceable batteries. That's absolutely something the current Remarkable doesn't provide. And so in order to achieve that result and to be able to continue to sell their products after that 2027 deadline, they're going to have to come up with a new design. And they can't just simply tweak what they currently have um, because they have to fundamentally redesign uh, the device. So clearly there'll be a Remarkable 3 somewhere between now and 2027. I guess the question then becomes, will it be sooner rather than later? And there's a lot of buzz and a lot of people thinking, no, it's going to be sooner. It's time. You know, the, the competition is starting to, to kind of, at least on paper, kind of eat into what makes Remarkable special. But actually, as it turns out, the numbers don't support that. Now, I do have to caveat this, is that there is a dearth of information regarding sales figures. Um, almost all note-taking companies are private. They don't release their sales numbers. Um, the E-Ink Corporation, where all these screens come from, does release their information, but it's so consolidated that you have no idea how that translates to how these other companies that buy their product are performing, uh, you know, how, what units they're selling and what have you. So it's very difficult to get any kind of information, but it's not impossible. So I was able to go in to the Amazon store, and this is the store for the United States, and uh, for items that sell a certain amount, I think the threshold might be 50, maybe it's 25, I'm not 100% sure, but certainly at least at 50, they'll note if uh, Amazon sold 50 or more of those products, and then they go up in increments. They go up to 100, you know, 250, 500, 1,000, and so on. So you do get a sense of how these items are selling now. Um, and so I'll just kind of go down those numbers. Now, of course, this is very myopic. It's only one store. It doesn't include what's, ever, what's selling from, say, the Remarkable store or, or other stores. It's only in the U.S. market. Lots of limitations here. But when you don't have a lot of information, you just kind of run with what you've got. And this is what I've got. So let me just tell you the numbers, and then I'll kind of explain why I think this has some relevance. So first off, um, on the Amazon marketplace, the Kindle sells about 10 to 11,000 copies uh, of their scribe over the past month. Um, and that makes a lot of sense. It's the, probably the only place you can buy the scribe, except for maybe like eBay or places like that, um, is on the Amazon store. So you would expect those sales to be quite robust. 
Remarkable is next. They have various bundles, but if you combine those together, they look to be selling about four to 7,000 devices a month. So a notably, notable gap less than Amazon. But again, remember, Remarkable is gonna sell here and then they're gonna sell off of their website as well. So they are they feel like they're in a pretty healthy position related to the scribe. Next up is the books devices. Now, if I add up combined, the last three kind of major 10 inch devices that books released, I'm talking the Note Air 3C, which was released in October of last year. I'm talking about the Note Air 3, which was released, um, I think December or January, uh, this past December or January. And then I'm talking about the just released in June, Books Go 10.3. Those three things combined are selling about one to 2,000 units over the past month. And then if you broke it down, uh, you know, Kobo, uh, the Ellipsa 2E is barely selling just about 50 units to, to 100 a month. And then uh, like Pocketbook, Mobiscribe, BigMe, who are all also sold on the Amazon store, don't even register a sales number. So they're selling at least less than 50, maybe even less than 25 units over the past month. The only major device manufacturer who's not sold on Amazon in the United States is Supernote. So no idea about how Su Supernote's selling, um, but we'll, we'll get to that. Um, I, we can kind of estimate that broadly looking at Reddit subscribers. So we'll get there in a second. But my point being is that the Remarkable is selling really well and particularly in contrast to books. I mean, books arguably is one of the, the other major competitors in this space, um, relatively well known. They don't have the brand recognition of a Remarkable or of an Amazon. Um, but despite the fact that the Go in particular that advertised itself uh, as, you know, a competitor to the Remarkable 2, it's not moving anywhere near as many units as the four-year-old Remarkable 2 is. So my point here in all these numbers is basically to say they're selling. I mean, we can talk all we want about how on paper other devices are coming in and have superior specs. We can talk about how we like these devices better than Remarkable. And I'm certainly one of those people. I, I really like these those books devices. I love the Super Note. I would pick those devices over the Remarkable personally based on my reviews. But in reality, in the actual sales data that we have, limited as it is, Remarkable is doing fine. There's no evidence that this competition is actually impinging much on their sales. Now, that doesn't mean there isn't you know, some cannibalism uh, from these device manufacturers from Remarkable. Everyone would want to go after Remarkable's market. They, they have one of the biggest markets uh, or you know, some people that own their devices um, you know, in this industry. But there's no evidence that they're in danger. Um, these sales numbers look pretty robust to me. Another thing I like to do is I look at the subreddit membership uh, for these various device manufacturers, and you can see what that is here on the grid. That's not necessarily the name of the, the subreddits, but it is clearly uh, the manufacturers the subreddits are about. So for example, the books one is actually onyx underscore books. Nevertheless, um, this represents how each manufacturer um, is doing in terms of subreddit. And you can see clearly the Kindle um, is number one by a large margin, but the Remarkable is number two. And I'll point out that both in the case of Kindle as well as Kobo, those members on those subreddits are predominantly around e-readers, not necessarily e-note takers. So it's notable how Remarkable is positioned on the list and it's in a very strong position. In fact, you could basically add up uh, Supernote and books and you'd roughly get the equivalent of the Remarkable subscription base. And one other thing I would say in addition to that, and this is just my gut here, you know, no evidence to support this, but I suspect proportionately more books and Supernote members participate in Reddit than Remarkable members participate in Reddit. And I guess I could probably go into kind of why I believe that. I just think that Remarkable basically pitches itself to a much wider audience thanks to its its heavy advertising campaign over the life of the company. Um, again, going back to that brand recognition. And I just think that the, the books and Supernote offerings are a little more technical. And I, I just feel like that those user bases are more likely to join in on a place like Reddit than maybe a Remarkable user would be. 
my point being is I think that that actually if we the remarkable numbers if proportionate would be m much higher than they are um, even than this grid indicates and they still are quite high on the list so that's my supposition but the point being is that remarkable is still very strong um, and that coupled with those sales numbers we've shared they're really in this great position and I don't think the competition again is kind of coming at them the way that maybe people think they are and what that means ultimately is that remarkable is under no pressure to release that remarkable three at any particular time you know they can release it anytime between now and 2027 um, and I think they're they'll be just fine from a business perspective so they're really on their own timetable for this we could have a remarkable three by the end of the year. That's definitely possible. Or we could have one in 2025 or 2026. Um, so that's my take. I just don't feel that, um, that they're under the pressure that people think they are to release a product. And as a result, it may take a while for a new remarkable three to surface. You know, my thoughts on remarkable overall, um, they're in a very defensible position in the marketplace. Their brand recognition, which sometimes is pointed out as a negative. I mean, some people look at Remarkable and say, well, the only reason why they're doing well is because they've advertised so much. And, you know, there's these other companies that are you know, releasing better devices. And I think there is some truth to that. But the reality is their, their brand recognition that they've built up um, is very strong. And look, Books and Supernote have been around for a few years now. They're not new entrants to the marketplace. And if they haven't been able to kind of you know, position themselves better uh, by now, I, I don't know why that's going to change in the next year. Like, I, I really think what Remarkable has done is notable, um, and it's going to be difficult for any entrant into the marketplace to knock them off, even if they are offering a better product, as I do think is the case with Supernote and Books, at least from my perspective. And, that, and that's the other thing about Remarkable. I think what people kind of miss about it is I think Remarkable is fundamentally meeting the needs of the people who buy Remarkable devices. Um, you know, yes, I think that Supernode and Books offers more sophisticated note-taking apps that can do more. But what if you're someone that the Remarkable does everything you need it to do? Do you want that additional functionality? Or would you rather that be stripped away so that you have a cleaner interface to work with? I think that's the decision that people make when they buy a Remarkable, is they look at that UI. It's not intimidating at all. It's doing all the things they want it to do. And that's why they flock to Remarkable. That's another reason why I'm a little pessimistic about these attempts to try to eat away at Remarkable. I think manufacturers will continue to try to do that and they'll have some success. There will be some Remarkable users that find themselves wanting more, but I just don't think that that's explains the majority of Remarkable users. So Remarkable is in this really amazing position. And in a conjunction with that, despite the fact that there was all this kind of negativity that came along with charging a subscription, and it was deserved, um, I don't know if that ultimately hurt Remarkable. And their user base is so solid, and that cost of that subscription is so low. You know, it's in America, it's $3 a month, or you can buy it for $30 a year. Now, a lot of people would balk at that and say, well, I, I can get it for nothing over here. But $30? I mean, I, I it, where I live, it's not uncommon if I go out and I'm going out not to a, a fancy restaurant. I'm just grabbing food to take back to the office. $20 is basically the average. So this is basically one and a half lunches over the course of a year. That's That's nothing. But it's a lot for Remarkable. So with their massive user base, even if you know less than half of their user base is on the subscription model, and I have no idea what that percentage is, but they're making an income revenue stream that no other device manufacturer has. Um, and again, that just builds in to their core strength of their, their brand uh, uh, penetration in the marketplace. And it, it just allows them, again, to dictate the terms and when they're going to release their next device. Um, because they have this income stream going in, let alone the fact they're still selling units way above the competition. You know, the last thing I'll just throw out there is that, you know, the latest tech isn't always necessary in moving forward, um, you know, e-ink note-taking. In fact, I could make an argument that, you know, 
for e-ink, the two things that it does the best is reading and writing. Those are things that I can make the argument that what e-ink does improves on what it's replacing, that, that e-books are superior to hardcover books. And, and I won't make the argument here, but I can make that argument. I can make the argument that e-note-taking is superior to note-taking on paper. And here's the thing, I could have made that argument years ago. So the technology from years ago is still relevant today in terms of how it's superior to re, you know to books and to, to writing on notepads. So yes, the technology of the Remarkable 2 is older. And yes, you have newer devices that can be a little snappier, uh, it has better battery life, uh, no question about that. There, there's devices that go, like again, beat the Remarkable 2 in all those dimensions uh, when I did my review uh, a few weeks ago. But the Remarkable 2 is still a valid device that delivers on the promises that it's making. I know a lot of people get frustrated that they're updating at a slow pace. They're not bridging the gap between themselves and a super note in a books. I'm going to keep going back to this. I don't think they need to. I don't think they're interested in it. It's almost counterproductive to their market base. If they start adding all these features and becoming more complicated and adding more icons on their UI, that's not what differentiates them versus a books in a super note. That's where they're actually exposing themselves more to the competition by adding these features. Why would you do that if you're remarkable? Clearly, they're in a strong market position. Clearly, they're maintaining that strong market position. Um, yes, I absolutely would use a books or a super note device over a remarkable device. And I think a lot of people viewing this video, because that's my audience, would feel the same way. But there are tons of people that don't feel that way at all. And I just think Remarkable's in a very strong position. I don't think people kind of respect or understand how good of a position they're in. And as a result of that, kind of put expectations on a Remarkable that they're going to just continue to be disappointed because their interests don't necessarily align with Remarkable's or the folks that use Remarkable's interests. And that's just kind of my personal editorial on that. But there's no question that Remarkable, as a company, has been a pioneer in the e-note-taking space. Um, they're going to continue to be around. There will be a Remarkable 3. Just we, no one has any idea of when it's going to come out. And I think, based on people's expectations, I get the feeling like when it does come out, there's going to be a lot of disappointed people about it. Because it may not be nearly as big of an update as you think it might be. But... That's just my two cents looking at the tea leaves. If you disagree, please put that in the comments. Uh, any questions or, or other comments, just pop that down there. Um, I'll re I reply to most of them. And I look forward to that, and I will see you next time.